Okay. Okay, it's my pleasure today to welcome Panos Gastis. Panos was a graduate student here working in nuclear astrophysics. Uh, he did his PhD, finished in 2020, and promptly moved to Los Alamos in a postdoctoral position. And today, Panos is going to talk about his current research there. Uh, that is uh, with the fission product yields using a detector system called SPIDER. So, Pano, um, uh, before I start, I would say that uh, let's keep the questions for the end. Okay, so we'll have everything some organized matter. And with that, Pano, you have the floor. Thank you very much, George, for the introduction. And thank you very much for inviting me, actually, today. I mean, I'm, I'm very happy um, to give this presentation. I mean, I wish I was there in person, of course, but uh, this could not happen. But I hope to find a chance and visit you at some point soon. So, yeah, I'm going to talk... Um, about a topic that uh, I have been working on since last year, since I moved uh, here at Los Alamos National Lab as a postdoc. And as the title says, uh, it has to do with measurements of uh, independent fission product yields uh, with the spider detector system at the Los Alamos uh, Neutron Science Center facility. And I'm going to talk about um, all these technical terms that you see in the title now in a minute. So, presentation uh, is separated in four parts. Uh, Part number one is introduction. I'm going to quickly uh, describe what fission product yields are, why they are important, and how we measure them. Then the second part, I'm going to introduce you to the uh, SPIDER instrument, uh, where we use for measuring fission product yields at LANL, and also introduce you to the Los Alamos um, Internal Science Center facility, where we do all these measurements. And then part number three, I'm going to talk about a gamma ray tagging system that we recently um, uh, implemented in SPIDER. It has to do uh, it has to do with the calibration of the instrument, uh, which is a um, technical challenge, as you will see later. Uh, and then in the last part, I'm going to show you some general things uh, about the current status of the uh, instrument. So let's start with a, a first quick introduction about nuclear fission. Uh, so in simple terms, uh, nuclear fission is a process in which a, a, a heavy nucleus, and by heavy I mean it has more than 220, 230 atomic mass units, um, Absorbs, uh, absorbs a light particle, typically a neutron, and then uh, becomes unstable, gets deformed, and eventually uh, splits into small fragments, uh, that are fusion fragments, large amounts of energy uh, in the form of kinetic energy and excitation energy on the fusion uh, products. Now, this uh, excitation energy of the products is quickly released in the form of prompt uh, neutrons and gamma rays. Now, down here at the bottom, you see a time scale that uh, roughly shows um, when uh, different stages uh, during the fission process takes place. Uh, on the very left, uh, very fast, um, uh, we have the, the scission. Now, scission is the moment where the two fragments uh, uh, split, split apart, and it happens very fast after the nucleus has uh, passed the fission barrier and has become unstable, typically uh, in time scales of the other 10 to minus 20 seconds. Then we have the prompt neutron emission, um, at about 10 to minus 18 seconds from gamma rays in the order of 10 to minus 20, 12, like 14 to 10. Uh, and then at a later time, like in time scales of microseconds after the fission, um, the fission products further decay toward more uh, stable configurations, uh, beta, um, um, through beta decays, and we may have um, uh, additional emission of uh, neutrons and gamma rays at later times. Though those, uh, those emissions, uh, those uh, decays are not uh, directly, let's say, connected with the fission uh, itself. Now, one last thing I want to point out uh, in this uh, slide is that um, uh, the fission yields, which means basically the probability of uh, producing a fission fragments with masses, let's say, M1 and M2, uh, are called independent when they correspond to the masses right after the prompt neutron emission, but before the beta decays, while at the later time scales uh, and after the, the products start to decay, they're called cumulative fission yields. 
So when we do measurements of fission yields in order to study fission, the fission process and extract information about the fragment formation, we do measurement on independent fission yields after the prometron emission before the beta decays. Here you see an example of a distribution of fission products uh, from uh, uh, the Californium T52 spontaneous fission. Um, you can see them on the chart of nuclides. So the chart has um, the, the uh, vertical axis is proton number, horizontal axis is neutron number, and, um, and the dark, the black boxes uh, show where the, uh, the stable nuclei are. And as you can see, uh, there are hundreds of different, different nuclides that are produced by the fission um, um, process, and the vast majority of them are neutron rich and stable nuclei um, that eventually decay back to uh, stability. Here you see the two main groups. Uh, one for the light fragments, one for the heavy fragments. And then on the right, you see uh, the corresponding mass distribution um, uh, of these uh, yields. Now, typically, all the experimental results for measurements on fission product yields are um, given in this form, uh, like in this plot here on the right. Now, why do we care about fission product yields? Fission product yields are important um, both for, for fundamental physics and application. Like for the case of uh, fundamental physics, we can extract by measuring fission product yields um, uh, useful information about the fission barriers and, um, and uh, improve the theoretical model that we use for uh, predicting fission probabilities. But they're also directly related with uh, critical nuclear applications, like, for example, design of nuclear reactor, uh, reactors, radioactive waste management, and uh, um, uh, uh, nuclear weapons. And all these areas are directly connected with the core mission of uh, the Los Alamos National uh, Laboratory. Now, although uh, we studied nuclear fission uh, for uh, many decades, there are still actually a uh, huge um, uh, lack of experimental data on fission for the yields. Um, um, and another thing apart from the uh, lack of data is that if we go and see the different um, uh, data sets, uh, we can see that there are actually large deviations uh, uh, between them. For example, here on the left, you see experimental data on fission product yields from Californium 252. And if we look uh, closely, we can see that different data sets actually have uh, discrepancies between them. Uh, um, there are at least 10%, or if we look at the uh, regions around the tails, are even larger. And um, this uh, says that uh, there are systematic uncertainties in these data sets that were not properly taken into account. And they are only revealed when we compare uh, all of them together. Another thing about the data, the, uh, the current available data, is that um, the resolution is not great. Typical resolutions are of the order of three to five atomic mass uh, units, which is not great. And uh, it's important because the resolution in the measurement can affect, uh, can affect actually the, the shape of this uh, distribution. And the issue here is that uh, in many cases, uh, the resolution is not uh, well known, it's, it's basically estimated. And this uh, creates further complications when we try to uh, compare this uh, experimental data with, uh, with theoretical models. And one last thing is that um, uh, the data on the energy dependent fission product yields, uh, when we talk about neutron induced fission, are even less. Like here on the, on the right, you see an example of uh, fission product yields as a function of neutron energy for uh, the case of um, uh, Neobidium 147. Uh, that is produced from uh, by neutron induced fusion on plutonium 239. Now, this, this particular isotope is important because it has a strong gamma ray transition that makes it uh, um, ideal for, for being used as a monitor uh, in, um, in monitoring the fusion rate on plutonium samples. And as we see, uh, even for this important, let's say, uh, nuclei, there are very limited data in the uh, neutron energy range of interest, which spans from thermal energies all the way up to about, let's say, 20 MeV. And there is not even a single, uh, there is not uh, like a complete data set, let's say, that covers properly this um, energy range of, uh, of interest. Therefore, there is a, a huge need for um, experimental data on fission for the yields. Now, I'm going to mention three of the most, uh, let's say, important um, techniques that we are uh, widely used for measuring fission for the yields. And I'm going to start first with the, with the electromagnetic separation uh, technique. Now, um, this is a picture of the Lohe Green Fusion Product Spectrometer. It has been developed in France um, um, years ago. 
and is one of the very first actually um, spectrometers that were developed for this kind of uh, fission research. Uh, it has produced um, very um, useful and important data on, on nuclear fission that helped improving the, the, the fission models. The basic uh, principle behind the technique is, very, is fairly simple. The, the target sample um, are, are placed uh, very close to um, a small nuclear reactor that they have. So it's bombarded by neutrons, and then the fission products are guided uh, into a dipole magnet uh, that separates uh, the various uh, fission products based on their mass and charge state. And then tuning, tuning it accordingly, uh, we can isolate uh, only fragments with a certain uh, uh, mass over charge um, ratio to be measured. Now, um, as I said, with this technique, we have produced um, um, very useful experimental data. And basically, this technique has an incredibly high uh, uh, mass resolution, which is in the order of 0.2 atomic mass units full width of maximum. Uh, however, when we, uh, we want to measure um, energy dependent fission product yields with fast neutrons, these are measurements in the order of uh, MEV that are very important for nuclear applications. Um, this method is not um, usable because it suffers from very low. Uh, from low efficiencies. Therefore, it cannot be used. Uh, although, I mean, it, it's good for, uh, for measurements at thermal energies, it's not good when we go to higher uh, neutron energies because the fission cross-section um, at energies above one MeV or maybe, yeah, in the order of MeV, um, drop very fast. Uh, another widely used technique for measurement of uh, fission product yields is the 2E method. Um, in this method, they used uh, instruments that are called fission chambers uh, that look like uh, the, the, the scheme here on the left and the picture on the right. I'm not going to get into the details of how exactly the measurement is done, but the point here is that um, with these um, detectors, they use, they extract, I'm sorry, they, they measure basically the kinetic energy and the emission angle of the fission products. And then by using momentum conservation, they extract their masses. Now, this technique, as I said, uh, has been widely used in the past, has very high efficiency because the target is technically inside the detector and we can measure almost every uh, emitted fission fragment. However, it has two very important uh, limitations. The first one is the low resolution, it's in the order of four to five atomic mass units. And the second one, which is the most important one, is that the analysis of the data with this method are model dependent. Like, as I mentioned earlier, for extracting the mass of the fragments, we use momentum conservation, but here we have no information about the neutron emission because the neutrons uh, also carry some amount of momentum that has to be properly taken into account. And therefore, for extracting the mass of the fragments, we basically rely on theoretical models about the neutron emission, which means that um, the final result is not 100% experimental. And then the last uh, method that it's uh, one of the most promising ones for producing um, reliable data on physical product yields with high resolution um, and accuracy is the 2E to V method and is the one that we basically um, use in SPIRE. Here, the mass of the, fragment, uh, of the fragments is uh, extracted by measuring both their kinetic energies and velocity, very simple principles. And up here in this uh, scheme, you see the detector configuration that uh, are, is typically used for this type of measurements. Actually, this, this particular picture is the interior of uh, SPIDER, but I will come back um, on, on, the, on the detectors uh, in the, later in the presentation. Now, the, um, the velocity of the fusion fragments with this method is extracted from time of flight, and then the kinetic energy using energy detectors, like, uh, for example, an ionization chamber. Um, now, this technique, um, has a, uh, a pretty high mass resolution, uh, in principle, in the order of one atomic mass units or even, or even better. And then by having the ability to measure uh, the mass of both fission fragments, left and right, we can extract, um, apart from the fission product yields, uh, uh, more, uh, I want to say, additional useful uh, information about the fission and fission parameters, like the total kinetic energy of the fission fragments and the neutron multiplicity. With the neutron multiplicity, it's basically the average a uh, number of neutrons that is emitted in a fission event and typically is measured as a function of uh, mass. We can measure all these things with this uh, method. Now, of course, but, uh, there is no technique that is perfect. There are always uh, disadvantages and um, some challenges that we, have to that we face when we use this method 
um, has to do with the energy and timing resolution uh, that that they have to be as uh, high as possible. Now, in, in principle, the detector system that we use offer the resolution that we want, but in order to uh, not see this in practice, you know, uh, in practice, um, it's not a, an easy task. And another challenge has to do with the energy corrections and the calibrations um, that are very important in the extraction of mass. I'm not going to go into more detail now. I'm going to uh, come back to this in the third part of the presentation, where I will discuss in more detail what these challenges are and how we uh, we overcome uh, come them in uh, spite. So this is uh, where the first uh, uh, part uh, ends. Now I'm going to continue with the second part, where I'm going to uh, introduce to introduce you to the spider detector system in more detail and talk a little bit about the Los Alamos uh, Neutron Science Center uh, facility where we do uh, the measurements. Now, before I provide more information about LAMS, I want to first like take a minute and first uh, explain how neutron beams are produced at uh, Los Alamos. So at LAMS, uh, neutron beams are produced via the spallation method. The principles behind it uh, are fairly simple. We use a, um, a heavy target nucleus. At LAMS, we use a, a tungsten uh, spallation targets that are bombarded by high energy proton beams and when the the, the high energy protons hit the, the target nuclei literally they break them apart in small pieces uh, and creating in this way a large number of uh, free neutrons the neutrons that eventually will uh, will form the neutron beam now neutrons are not uh, charged particles therefore like we cannot uh, steering them or control them with a uh, with, uh, with magnets as we, as we use with charged particle beams. Therefore, for making a neutron beam, basically we rely on using uh, absorbers and, uh, and collimators. Now to, to explain how this happens, uh, I added this uh, picture here on the right. This is from an old paper that shows a planned view of the LAMS moderator and flight path uh, arrangement. You can imagine that this is actually uh, a cross section of a cylinder. The production target, the spallation target is right at the center of this uh, circle here, and the beam is coming from, uh, from above and hits the, the spallation target. So after the collision, uh, uh, free neutrons are emitted in all directions and uh, in, a vast, in, in a large energy range. Uh, and and um, what we do is we use uh, uh, um, attenuators or uh, absorbers, let's say, to prevent neutrons from going to certain areas allowing them only to move through certain flight paths that actually uh, are the places where um, are the structure, let's say, um, that actually shape uh, a neutron beam. The experimental um, setups that uh, are using the neutron beam are usually, are, um, how to say, are stationed outside of this, uh, of this circle. And then within each of these uh, flight paths, using additional absorbers and collimators, and collimators we can eventually uh, shape uh, a neutron beam um, uh, at the location where the experimental setups are stationed. Um, this is a picture of the LANS facility at Los Alamos with, um, with the um, uh, main buildings. Here on the right is where um, the linear accelerator uh, is. Um, uh, LANS has a very powerful uh, proton accelerator that accelerates the protons at about 100 MeV, and then um, and then the experimental areas where uh, where they uh, employed neutron beams are located there on the left in the circle, and this is where the the production targets, the the spallation targets, are also located. So therefore, the the proton beam for um, for the neut uh, neutron facilities uh, is guided into this area in the circle. So if we zoom in there, you can see uh, more clear the two main uh, experimental facilities at LANS. The first one is the ER1 area here on the on the right. Um, this is where the first target, spallation target is that produces uh, low energy neutron beams. And by low energy, I mean less than 100 kV and all the way down to um, thermal energies, which means in the order of EV. And then the second main area is on the left, is the WNR, where the target four is, that produces high energy neutron beams um, and I'm talking about a range between 100 kV and all the way up to hundreds of uh, MeV neutrons. And here you can also see the, the various flight paths arranged around the production targets. Um, 
This is now a picture of, uh, of the two arm spider system. Uh, I think this is the first time I mentioned here in my presentation that uh, spider actually is an acronym uh, that stands for spectrometer for ion determination in fusion research. Well, not the, not the great name, let's say, but the acronym is cool. Um, the target holder um, of spider is right there uh, uh, in, at the center in the middle of this uh, cylindrical um, vacuum chamber that houses uh, the timing detectors. For the time of flight in spider, we use microchannel play detectors, but uh, I'm going to now um, talk in more detail in, uh, in the next few slides. While for the kinetic energy, we use ionization chambers. Uh, in this picture, the, the beam axis uh, is shown by this uh, red line. Now, one of the main goals of the spider project is not only the measurement of fission product yields at, let's say, thermal energies, but to measure energy-dependent fission product yields in a range that spans from thermal energies all the way up to 20 MeV. These are critical uh, measurements for uh, nuclear applications. And in order to achieve that, we need to have um, a system that has a relatively high uh, geometric efficiency. As I mentioned earlier, uh, when we measure fission products at uh, with fast neutrons, uh, we have to fight. Um, we have to fight this uh, decrease in the uh, uh, fission cross section. Like here on the right, you see a plot that shows cross section as a function of energy for uranium two thirty five and plutonium two thirty nine neutron induced fission. And as you see, uh, the, the the cross section of uh, neutron induced fission goes from something of the order of uh, tenths of uh, bonds at thermal energies, all the way down to or the order of one bar at um, the range of uh, MeV. Therefore, in order to do uh, measurements in this energy range here, we need something that has a large geometric efficiency. And to achieve that, we have uh, uh, developed, apart from the 2R system, uh, spider system, the mega spider um, configuration that you see here in the picture, and I also show in this next slide. Now, mega spider, has about 10 times larger geometric efficiency than, of course, the, the two-arm system. Uh, eventually, it will utilize 16 ionization chambers uh, with 16 stop MCP detectors, one in front of each ionization chamber. And then it has four start MCP detectors that you see them there at the center um, of the main chamber. Uh, now, the, the target sample in the mega spider configuration will be right there at the, at the center, at the middle of the, of the main chamber. Um, um, and in, uh, surrounded by these start MCP uh, detectors. Now, the the, the uh, mega spider chamber has been developed already. We have it uh, done; it's fabricated, but we haven't connected any of the detectors yet. This is uh, more uh, of a future project, let's say, for the next uh, two or three years. Now, this is a picture of the microchannel plate detector, the MCP detectors that we use for the time of flight. On the left, uh, you see the full assembly of how it looks like. And here on the left, uh, you see how it works. So fission uh, through um, the, a very thin uh, carbon conversion foil um, um, that is uh, attached in the detector assembly. Uh, it produces secondary electrons that are accelerated by an acceleration grid towards an electrostatic mirror, which is at 45 degrees uh, there that bends the electrons and guide them to, uh, towards the MCP plates that are there at the bottom. Now down here at the very bottom uh, picture, you see how the uh, MCP plates uh, work. So when a secondary electrons, uh, electron uh, um, um, hits the surface of the, of, uh, of the MCPs, it gets trapped into one of the uh, micro channels. And then as it moves towards the anode, which is at the exit down here that attracts the electrons, uh, it bounces on the walls of the of the microchannel, creating more electrons. In this way, the signal is amplified in a similar way as the photomultiplier tubes uh, basically work. Now, um, these detectors uh, have actually pretty high, um, can I say, pretty high timing resolutions. But they're on the order of uh, less than 250 picoseconds full width of maximum, and makes them ideal actually for being used for um, for the application that uh, that we want for them for um, um, implementation in time of flight measurements for the 2E, 2V uh, method. And another detail, I, I, I didn't mention it, but I'm not going to go into, into more uh, details on that. Um, the anode of this uh, detector assembly is, uh, has a form of delay line. 
And what it means, uh, this means is that uh, we can have also information about the position of the fission fragment uh, when it passes through the conversion uh, foil. And the resolution of these detectors on position is about uh, two millimeters uh, in full width of uh, maximum. These are pictures uh, now of the ionization chamber detectors that we use uh, for measuring the kinetic energy of the fission fragments. Uh, we use axial ionization chambers. And here uh, on the right, I'm sorry, on the left, uh, you see uh, a scheme of uh, the basic uh, uh, operation principles, let's say, of the detectors. Now, the detectors have thin, um, uh, thin entrance window that allow the, the fission fragments to get into the, the gas volume of the detector uh, that is filled with isobutane, uh, pure isobutane in our case. Now, as the uh, fission fragments uh, uh, move into the um, isobutane gas, ionizes the, the molecules, creating free electrons that drift towards the anode that is positively um, biased uh, and creates a signal that is directly proportional to the kinetic energy of the, um, uh, of the fragment. Our ion chambers have um, um, fish grids. These are um, grids that are mounted in front of the anodes, and we use them for shielding the anode from uh, unwanted induced signals due to mirror charges from from the presence of um, positively um, charged uh, molecules resulted from the ionization. Um, therefore, the free grid is important for uh, achieving high energy resolution. And then another thing that uh, our chambers have uh, is uh, guard rings. You can see actually the, the guard rings of the ionization chambers in this picture here. And, and the purpose of these guard rings is to preserve uh, a uniform, a nice electric field through all the active uh, uh, volume of the detector. Now, although the, the design of these ionization uh, chambers is pretty old, like it was developed like in the 60s or 70s, uh, still they offer uh, a great energy resolution, which is better than 1% in full width of maximum. And it makes them ideal actually to be used for fission fragments as they uh, basically perform better than even state-of-the-art uh, solid state detectors. And this is the reason that we adapt this, uh, this type of detectors. We, we use this type of detectors in uh, SPIDER, as we want to have as maximum um, energy resolution as possible. And these are pictures uh, from the windows of the ionization chambers. Uh, we use uh, ultra-thin silicon nitride uh, windows, about 200 nanometers in thickness. We want them to be as thin as possible uh, in order to minimize any energy losses of the fission fragments uh, in the entrance window and also minimizing the energy struggling. Again, for uh, maximizing the um, the effective resolution. On the left, uh, you see the old design of the of the windows, this square design that ended up actually being uh, pretty bad because this uh, square um, cells, because of their shape, uh, the windows could break very easily. So in the past, they were suffering from very frequent windows failures that were catastrophic because they were also um, 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 creating problems on the MCP detectors after that and causing uh, huge delays on fixing everything. We fixed this problem recently with a new design that you see on the, on the right side. The new design is uh, based on a circular geometry. It's way better, much more durable, and were specially designed and fabricated for us uh, by a Canadian uh, company. So far, uh, at least we didn't have any single um, problem with the, with the window frame. Let's hope that we won't have today that I talk about. Uh, <laughs> Now, this part stops here. Um, I show you details about, uh, about the detectors that uh, are used in SPIDER and the 2E2V uh, method. And now I'm going to I'm gonna, uh, move to the third part, where I will focus on this gamma ray tagging system that we uh, implement in SPIDER for uh, calibrating. I'm going to quickly jump in the first slide of this part to explain. So I'm coming back to the challenges that I mentioned earlier about the the energy corrections that we have to do when we use this uh, 2E2B method. So as we said, we, we, we calculate the mass of the fragments by measuring the, their uh, velocity and energy. Now, the thing is that the kinetic energy that we measure with the ionization chamber does not correspond to the energy that the, fra that, that the fission fragments have when they, uh, when they move between the two timing detectors, because they, the fragments lose some amount of energy in the carbon foil, in the conventional foil of the MCP and the entrance window of the um, um, of the fusion chamber, and 
even if these uh, uh, energy losses are relatively small, are extremely important because they are the insert systematic uncertainties when we go to calculate the mass. Now, in principle, one relies for doing these corrections on stopping power models. But the problem is that we know that the stopping power models, theoretical models, uh, are for, for, heavy, uh, for heavy ions, especially, are in the best case scenario within 5%. In our case, this 5% is huge because we want to uh, do these high precision measurements. And therefore, this is actually uh, an issue that uh, it's not so easy to overcome using, um, I don't know, corrections, let's say, on the models. And another uh, important thing here is the pulse height defects. Uh, now, the pulse height defects uh, has to do with the recombination of electrons inside the ionization chamber. And is an effect um, that causes the, the, the creation of pulses that are, not, that are smaller than it should for determining for the uh, for determining the kinetic energy of the um, of the fragments so this is a, um, a a kind of complicated issue um because the pulse height defects depends on the type of gas that is used the pressure of the gas but also on the mass atomic number and energy of the fission fragments therefore addressing uh, addressing let's say directly this uh, this issue is um is pretty challenging now the way that uh, uh, we choose to go in order to overcome uh, this, uh, this calibration issues is, and, this, uh, and this stuff that introduces systematic uncertainties in the calculation of mass is to introduce a gamma ray tagging system, to implement a gamma ray tagging system in SPIDER. And now the basic idea of the gamma ray uh, uh, tagging is that we want to use uh, gamma ray detectors for measuring characteristic gamma ray transitions from uh, known fission products, and then use this piece of information for calibrating the mass. And this should take into account any uncertainties in the uh, energy losses and pulse height defects, in principle. And another advantage of doing this is that we can also extract uh, directly from the data the actual uh, mass resolution uh, of the system, which is another important parameter um, for the data. Now, these plots here. Uh, uh, describe um, basically describe how this gamma ray tagging idea is expected to to work. Are all uh, uh, events from simulations? On the um, top right, you see simulated mass distributions, uh, mass distribution of fission products from Californium two fifty two spontaneous fission. Lower left, you see correlated gamma rays from these events. So basically, this is the simulated gamma ray spectrum uh, of Californium two fifty two uh, spontaneous fission. And then on the lower right, you see the mass distribution after gating on certain gamma ray energies. In this particular case, we gate on, uh, on gamma ray energies around uh, this peak, uh, uh, 200 k, 10 kb. And as you see, by using this set, uh, gamma ray tagging, we reveal sharp peaks on the mass spectra uh, that correspond to uh, certain isotopes that we can use for calibrating the mass uh, distribution, the, the, the mass spectrum, but also for extracting the mass resolution um, of, the, um, of the system. Whether uh, this idea can work in SPIDER and whether this actually uh, can really um, provide some useful results uh, on the real instrument. We performed this test uh, measurement uh, using the setup that I show in this picture here. For this, um, um, for this test, we use Californium sources that were mounted in the six-way cross that you see on the left. Uh, here in this test measurement, we, um, we use a single uh, spider arm configuration, just one of the, uh, of the arms. We, don't, we didn't measure the, the both fragments in coincidence, just, just one, because uh, it's enough for uh, proving uh, uh, whether this can work or not. And then another thing is that we didn't use an ionization chamber for the for measuring the kinetic energies. Um, in this test setup, we used a double-sided silicon strip detector, as you see on the right, that was mounted right behind the, the second MCP. And the reason we use a, a DSSD is because uh, it made the, the measurement a little bit more simple. Like having an ionization chamber there uh, was required to have uh, additional experimental components, required, uh, required to have um, a gas handling system and following certain um, safety procedures that would make the thing a little bit more complicated. Therefore, we just simplified the measurement using this uh, DSSD. We know that it's not going to perform as, as good as an addition chamber, but it's good enough for this test measurement. And then for the gamma ray tagging, for detecting the gamma rays uh, from the fissure fragments, we used uh, 
two germanium detectors very close to the sources for detecting the from gamma rays from the products and then one more on the back side of the detector uh, of the of the uh, of the time of flight chamber very close to the dssd which is behind this flange and this back detector uh, was measuring delayed gamma rays from physio fragments that are implanted on the dssd now when i say delayed gamma rays i don't mean gamma rays after the beta decay of the product i'm talking about gamma rays from metastable states on the on the products so we are still uh, talking about data related to independent fission uh, product yields and here are some results from that uh, test measurement uh, in these 2d graphs you see uh, histograms you see gamma ray energy versus mass on the on the right side uh, is the experimental data and as you see the coincidence events gamma rays associated with certain isotopes appear as uh, blobs uh, in these 2d histograms and we were able to identify actually from what exact isotope uh, these gamma rays were coming from and this was proving that we can actually uh, uh, see the coincidences uh, that we were looking for on the left is the same plot but from a simulation this is the simulated uh, uh, histogram and we use this uh, simulation uh, uh, to, as a guidance in order to um, uh, properly identify um, the isotopes from where the detected gamma rays are coming from. So as you see, actually the two plots are very similar. And now these plots are coming from, uh, are correspond to prompt gammas. So it's from the German detectors that were close to the sources. And these uh, other two uh, plots uh, are the same, but correspond to delayed gammas from the detector that was next to the DSSD. Again, on the left side, simulation, right side, experimental. Many similarities, we were able to uh, identify certain isotopes that we will want to use for the gamma ray type. And this is an example of how, how we basically use these coincidence events. Now on the, on the um, right plot, you see uh, the gamma ray spectrum from the delayed uh, gammas, where you see uh, a nice uh, photo peak that is coming from um, transitions in technetium 107. And then on the left, you see the corresponding mass distribution after uh, gating on this photo peak. So there is a nice and clean uh, peak, uh, mass peak associated with uh, technetium 107 that was perfect for, um, uh, for using it for the mass calibration that we want and also for extracting the mass resolution of the, of the system that was found to be in the order of 1.5 atomic mass units, which is basically great. It's a very good resolution considering that uh, that was not even the optimum um, uh, spider configuration, we use the DSSD that we know that is uh, not performing as well as an analyzation chamber. However, uh, we could achieve a pretty high mass resolution, very close to what we should expect when we use this uh, method. And then by, excuse me, analyzing many of these uh, events and this kind of peaks, we were able for the first time to extract um, this plot here on the left that shows mass resolution as a function of mass for uh, for the single spider uh, system. Now, this is very important. Uh, I mentioned that I think uh, earlier because when when we when we provide experimental data on fission product yields, it's important also to provide information about the resolution that these data correspond to because this is a critical parameter that has to be taken into account when the theoreticians try to use the experimental data for improving uh, or uh, fitting their uh, their models. And for the first time, we actually are able now to um, give this piece of information um, that is extracted directly from data and not based on estimates. And here on the, on the, on the right, you see the corresponding um, linear mass calibration function that we extracted again from the data. And these are uh, preliminary results from this uh, test measurement. On the left, um, you see the fission yields as a function of mass. Blue uh, are the experimental data points from uh, SPIDER, and the red are data from the evaluation, evaluated data from the England and Ryder evaluation, which is currently uh, one of the most uh, reli reliable data sets that are uh, extensively used uh, by everyone in the community. Uh, and what we can see here is actually uh, a pretty good um, 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 agreement between the two uh, curves. Now, it's not perfect. There are still some uh, details that uh, are not properly taken into account in, in the analysis. Um, uh, but still, despite that, uh, we see that the two curves are very close to each other. 
Another thing here uh, that uh, I want to point out is that um, when I do this comparison of this particular plot, I haven't taken into account the resolution of our data. So the, the evaluated data uh, are not smeared in order to match the, uh, the experimental. But despite that, still, we see, uh, we see actually uh, a pretty uh, good agreement, especially if we compare it with uh, a previous experimental attempt with uh, SPIDER, where if we look closer, the discrepancies between the experimental data back then and the evaluation are pretty large, especially in the um, regions uh, around the tails. And this was uh, actually due to problems they had with, um, um, with the energy corrections and the calibration. Something that we uh, overcome and overpassed, is that the right word? Yes. Uh, we solved, let's say, by using this uh, gamma ray tagging system that uh, we successfully implemented. So this was a big step toward producing uh, more accurate data with uh, with spider and this is the uh, this is the uh, final slide on this uh, third part it had to do with the calibration uh, and the implementation of the gamma retagging system and now i'm going to move on the last part it's going to be short like a, i'm going to show you just a few slides um, to give you a picture of uh, what is the current status uh, of the spider instrument so this is a picture of SPIDER um, currently. It is the two-arm system is deployed in, uh, uh, in Flight Path 12 at, in, at last facility for doing test measurements uh, with uh, thermal neutrons. Um, we have connected both arms with the ionization chambers. And at the same time, we use four germanium detectors trying to uh, um, um, now uh, reproduce the gamma ray tagging uh, data but now with the with optimal configuration. For this purpose, we have two germanium detectors close to the ionization, one of the two ionization chambers uh, for the delayed gammas. And we have two more uh, germanium detectors at the bottom of the six-way cross here. You cannot see them because they're sealed. And um, we're still in the process of acquiring statistics for uh, 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 being able to uh, give some quantitative results about the, the, the resolution and the response of this configuration. Uh, we don't have enough statistics yet, so I'm not gonna show any results on that. But I'm gonna show you this slide that gives some other like, useful information that uh, uh, describe in more detail what tests we actually do right now. Uh, up here in this scheme, uh, you see the shape of the target holder that we use for, uh, for these tests that we do now. We have a, a, a sample uh, at the center where the neutron beam passes through. Uh, currently, we use a thick backing sample. It has a uh, um, plutonium-239 deposition on one side and uranium-235 deposition on the other side. And then down here, uh, we also uh, have mounted some uh, Californium sources, five in one side and five on the other side. And now this target, uh, uh, this holder is, is uh, placed right at the center of the six-way cross and is tilted in a, in, in a way that uh, the plutonium side faces the one arm and the uranium side uh, faces the other one. Therefore, uh, at the moment, this test that we do, we operate each of the two arms uh, as an individual. Here on the, um, uh, on the right, you see, um, this is um, reconstructed positions of the fission events that we measure by using the the position signals of the MCP detectors that we have. So as you see, we can really nicely reconstruct actually the geometry of our target uh, holder. And this gives us the capability of uh, analyzing um, um, various different samples uh, simultaneously. Like we can both have California spontaneous fission and neutron induced fission from plutonium or uranium at the same, and analyze it at the same time. Now this is a, a useful capability because in principle can be used for calibration of the system when we have uh, California at the same time with a uh, with a sample there, and down here you see uh, at the bottom in these three graphs you see kinetic energy versus time of flight of the fission products from the three samples uh, that we uh, currently measure: California to fifty-two spontaneous fission, uranium to thirty-five neutron induced fission thermal, at thermal energies, and plutonium to thirty-nine neutron induced fission at the same time. So and this and this uh, uh, all these uh, uh, data are taken simultaneously in an efficient way. And one last thing I want to show you is this preliminary results on uh, fission product yields from plutonium-239 and uranium-235 neutron-induced fission. 
um, again, experimental data are with blue points, are the blue points and evaluation are the red. I want to point out here that since we don't have uh, enough statistics yet, I haven't done any corrections using the gamma ray tagging system yet. This is just, I've done a simple uh, linear uh, calibration in, in an attempt to match at least the shape uh, of, the, um, of the evaluated data. However, by doing this uh, simple correction, I was able, I mean, I saw that um, there is a nice agreement, basically. There are many points that are uh, in agreement within error bar with evaluation, both for both samples, and which is something actually uh, very promising and very good. And it's an indication that um, the resolution is, is very likely as high as we think that it is. Um, I had some more slides to show, but I removed them because I didn't want to uh, um, be too late. So I'm going to stop uh, my presentation here, and I'm going to uh, summarize the, the, the key points of the whole presentation. Starting with uh, the first point that uh, is fidelity nuclear data and fission product yields are very important, as we saw in fission modeling and applications uh, within this context, uh, in order to uh, produce high accuracy and high resolution data, we have adapted, we have, I mean, we were using uh, the 2 e 2 v method. And in this direction, uh, we successfully have uh, um, developed and implemented a gamma ray tagging system in SPIDER that allows for the first time an in-situ mass calibration on, on the instruments, um, which is um, very important in producing the, the reliable data that we want to. And we also, using this, uh, this tool, we're also uh, able to show that we can achieve a pretty high mass resolution with this instrument, better than two atomic mass units, fully half maximum uh, using a DSSD, very close to our uh, target, which is uh, um, a mass resolution of, of the order of one atomic mass unit. And, um, and finally, having these, uh, these tools, we can, um, be confident that we properly quantify the actual experimental ascendities when we provide uh, experimental data with our instruments. And it's something that uh, was an issue uh, in the past and actually still an issue for, um, for many um, um, other instruments uh, that are employed for measurement of uh, fission point yields. So uh, I'm going to stop here. I want to thank very much uh, my collaborators and the people that are involved in the SPIDER project at Los Alamos. And I want to thank you also very much for your uh, attention. Let me know if you have any questions. Hey, uh, let's hear some questions. Now, I know there are some people online. I'm not sure how to take the questions. But in the meantime, if you guys have any questions, I'll try to bring up the uh, participants here. Questions from the audience? Alfredo, can you yell or I can repeat the question? So, um, maybe a technical one. When you show the, the gamma ray spectra of what you detected next to the target or, or apart from the next to the, next to the chamber, you were looking at no different isotopes. Can you explain? Oh, 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 oh. This one, in this, you mean this spectrum? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear very well. Yeah. This one? Uh, or this the one? Same, the same gamma ring from the same process of the different isotopes detected next to the target or next to the. Like this one, for example? Yeah. Yeah, so what happens here? Because That's a good point. What happens here is the following. Uh, when you detect the gamma ray from, let's say, 100 zirconium, if you detect both fission fragments, unavoidable, you will also have a peak from the equivalent heavy fragment. That's why you, the, the peaks are double. And then these other peaks, is, uh, these uh, additional peaks, is because the, this, um, uh, these gamma rays uh, in this energy range are probably uh, are not coming from a single, uh, this is not probably a single photo peak here. I mean, this is just simulation, but apparently what happens is that um, there are more than one um, isotope, isotopes um, corresponding to the same uh, gamma ray energies. Most likely are two isotopes. And then we see the two isotopes plus their two 
um, uh, how to say, brother, or how to call them, their equivalent heavy or light um, uh, products. So, does this answer the question? No, <laughs> um, but but yeah, but it's a good point. Yeah, that's an interesting one. It was a different one. It was so the two spectra you show the the two D plots of the gammas you detected in the two different gamma detectors that you have here. Do you see? Yeah, th this one is the front gammas. Correct. Um, and you have also one gamma ray detector next to your species on uh, the ionization chamber, right? Yes, this is uh, this is with this setup here. Yeah. So we had the isotopes in both places, or 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 do you? Oh yes, I uh, no, we see isotope only with like in this configuration. One of the fragments goes through the time of flight and everything, and is measured, and the other one stays on the target. Because because it because it's sources and we don't have a second arm. But well, here, the, but here, the but time, does the time it take to reach the, the video fragment influence the? Ah, excellent. Yeah, the, the time of flight is in the yeah. This is the time of flight is in the order of uh, fifty to sixty nanoseconds. Fifty to sixty nanoseconds. Therefore, prompt gamma rays here are gamma rays that are emitted within a picosecond, in a picosecond range. And then delayed are gamma rays that are emitted, let's say, within a tenth of nanoseconds. Because there is enough time for the fissure fragment to travel through the time of flight and uh, stop in the detector, in the silicon detector. So these are the delayed gammas. Was this helpful? Oh, I'm trying to search, yes. Okay. Uh... Any discussion? Any other questions? I would like to ask one. Yeah. So, uh, is it worth it to have the ionization chamber after all? I mean, can't you do your job just with the DSSD? Chases <laughs> and you that. Know, Yes, 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 yes. That is a great question. Actually, we are think about it every day, um, because if we can really achieve like a, a decent resolution and with a with a, a setup that is much simpler than ionization chambers, then why why don't we just go with it? And um, we want to first see how the what the response of the system with ionization chambers uh, is. If we see that is way better. Then we will continue with ionization chambers. If we see that uh, other problems, like for example gain shifts or other effects, eventually destroy the resolution of the of the ionization chamber and brings it very close to a DSD, then it's worth to just switch to uh, solid state detectors, and this will simplify uh, by an order of magnitude also the construction of the mega spider, because a mega will be simpler instead of all the ionization chambers and a huge gas handling system and everything. But this will depend on the on the results that we will have uh, after um, characterizing the, the ionization chambers and the full um, configuration, let's say. Maybe next, by next year, I hope that we will have the, the results on that. Questions for panels. You go to Pajarito. You go to Pajarito. I suck in ski, but I've been there. It's a nice place, actually. It's very, it's, it's, it's really nice. <laughs> oh, there's a question. I can I cannot hear. I don't think you can hear. Can you speak up or maybe come closer? Just a, a curiosity. When you explained the flight path of the neutrons, I didn't get how the yeah, yeah, exactly the, the picture on the right. 
So how do you construct that? So how, how do you like uh, direct the, the neutrons inside those? Basically, yeah, that, that's a good, that's a good uh, question. You, you produce the neutrons and you don't do anything. You just let them fly wherever they go. And then you block the regions that you don't want to go and you let uh, open spaces in the region that, where you want, want them to continue flying. Yeah, great. Okay. Th that's all, really. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Good question. Good question, yeah. Yeah. And this, you can say maybe how big this, uh, this uh, circle is? Meter. Uh, this thing here is meters. Like maybe the scale, oh, the scale sucks here, but uh, like a flight path can be anything from 10 meters to 60 meters. But of course, when I say, uh, when I say that actually it's not accurate, I I'm not talking about this is a 60 meters thing because this, this is just the absorber. This is just the, the, the diameter of the uh, uh, absorber, which is a few meters. But then so the flight pass meters, and then continues. Yes, this is in the, maybe yeah, five to 10 meters, something like that. And this is actually a little bit older picture now. I think they, they have um, um, uh, changed a little bit the, the structure and the geometry of the actual uh, materials around the, the flight pass. But this is this was just a, a simplified, a, a nice and simple picture that I, just, I, I thought that is, it could be maybe more useful to be used in a, this presentation just to make it a little bit more easier to understand. Because in reality, these these uh, uh, absorbers, uh, like the structure, the, the geometrical structure of these absorbers, is, is more complicated. It's, it, it's not it's not as simple as shown in this picture. Yeah. There's a lot of material there, I guess. Yeah, there's a, exactly. There's a lot of material, different material, because um, um, you use also absorbers um, to uh, to shape um, to shape the spectrum of neutrons in a certain flight path. So it's it's not that this is just an open an open space that all neutrons fly directly from the target into uh, into the experimental area. There are further materials, further absorbers and filters uh, for shaping it properly and giving. Uh, um, the desired um, energy uh, uh, properties that we want for its flight path. Any more questions? Yeah. Yeah. Any more questions for Panos? One out of curiosity. How much was the window you got from the Canadian company? If you can... how, how much was the window? The, the yeah. second one? Yeah. Fifteen hundred per piece. <laughs> uh, hold on, define per piece. Each circle was fifteen hundred dollars. No, 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 no. Uh, the whole the whole thing. This whole thing is fifteen hundred dollars. Uh, that is not too bad. Yeah. Not too bad. And actually, considering the the delays and and the damages that a, a, a window failure was causing in the past these are extremely cheap now <laughs> cool i think uh, no other questions we're going to thank uh, panos thank you very much panos oh i thank you thank you again for inviting me i'm i'm i'm, I'm really happy that uh, that i was i was here today well, you're not exactly here, but you kind of. Yeah, let's say virtually. <laughs> okay. Very good. Thanks a lot. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, let's see. Let's stop recording. Stop sharing. Oh.